Alatulia Maldonia Ahara Mariese. My name is Rainbow Dave, and welcome, friends, to our second episode of Tolkien Untangled. So, if you've not seen the first episode, I'd suggest you go back and watch that first, because in that episode, I explained the origins of the universe and the nature of the gods of Arida. And a lot of that is going to come into play in this video. But just a quick recap. The universe of Ea was created by Eru Iluvatar and his Ainur, which he created as offspring of his thought. And these Ainur can be split into the 14 Valar, the most powerful, who are effectively a pantheon of gods themselves, and the Maya, who are more like demigods and angels. And the Ainur created the planet planet of Arda, where this entire story takes place. But you can't have a story without conflict, and as it goes, not all of the Ainur are good. In fact, one of them in particular turned hardcore towards evil, and his name is Melkor, and he's not alone. See, he's tempted a number of the Maya, the demigods, to his cause, and he's corrupted them into demons. And the most significant of these evil Maya are Sauron and the Balrogs. But it was while the world of Arda was being created that the first war was fought. Now this was a war amongst gods, but it ended in victory for the good guys. Because when Tulkas the Champion, the last of the Valar to descend from the Timeless Halls, entered Ea, Melkor fled before him and disappeared beyond the walls of night. So that is where we're going to pick up in this episode. Arida exists, it's a planet, it's not perfect, but it is the home of the gods, and the gods dwell there. And as I said in the last episode, at this very early point in Tolkien's cosmology, there's no sun and there's no moon, which means there's no natural source of light. So the first thing the Valar have to do is, well, make some lights of their own. Now, this video is called The Age of the Lamps, so you can probably guess what form these lights take. So in the last episode, I talked about Aule, the craftsman of the Valar, and it's Aule who builds the great pillars that these lamps will eventually sit on. So in the far north, he creates a great tower called Helkar, and in the south, he creates another tower called Ringil. Now, I should say that in much, much earlier drafts of Tolkien's Legendarium, these pillars are actually created by Melkor, and they were made out of ice, but this is certainly not the case in the published Silmarillion. And this is a, a good example of how sometimes Tolkien changed and adapted and kind of evolved his Legendarium over the course of his entire life. And so when you get little discrepancies and little contradictions like this, I feel like we have to go with what was written most recently, and in this case, what's published in the Silmarillion. But either way, to be honest, the pillars aren't actually that important. But what is important are the lamps that go on top of them. So you probably won't be surprised to hear that the light of the lamps was gathered by Varda, the Queen of Light. And it was her husband Manwe, the king of all the Valar, the king of Arida, who hallowed these lamps and lifted them up into the sky. And so all of Arida was lit by Iluin the Blue in the far north, and Oromal the Gold in the far south. Now, I want to take a moment to talk about this light, because it's not the sort of light that we're familiar with from our own world. No, this isn't photons. It's divine Ainur light. And this light enriches and enhances everything it touches. Now, at this time, in the Age of the Lamps, that's not particularly relevant because every living being is one of the Ainur, so they're already divine. But if somehow, say, an elf or a man were to time travel all the way back to this primordial era, the light would do crazy things to them. It would literally make them so much stronger and wiser, and they'd become a lot more in touch with the powers of Arda and even Eru Iluvatar himself. But anyway, that is just a tangent, because remember, there are no elves, no men, no dwarves, and no orcs at this time. Only Ainur. 
and the Ainur build for themselves their first kingdom in Arida. But the maps of Middle-earth don't really do justice to this period because frankly things were very different in the Age of the Lamps, and Middle-earth looked a little bit more like this. You see, I already said that the northern lamp is blue and the southern lamp is gold. But right in the middle, where the two lights meet and mingle into a pure white light, the vegetation of Yavanna grows greater than anywhere else. And right in the middle of the world, there is a great lake, and in that lake is the island of Alamaren. And Alamaren is where the Valar build their first paradise. Now, with a quick Google search, you can find loads of these really gorgeous paintings by Tolkien artists like Ted Naismith and many others that illustrate just how beautiful but how primeval these early years are. And Tolkien actually tells us that in this unfiltered light, the trees of Yavanna grow so tall that they touch the clouds as if they are living mountains. And he also mentions these strange beasts that come forth and dwell in the meadows of Alamarin. And at this time before time, the Ainur are content. But Melkor is not gone. He's been hiding, but he's had his eye constantly fixed on Arda. And after seeing the beauty and peace that the Valar have made, he is filled with even more hatred. Now, Tolkien tells us that Melkor had secret friends and spies among the Maya in Alamaren. And I'm going to have to speculate that one of these spies is good old Sauron, who from the very beginning seems to be honing his skills as the deceiver. Certainly not the last time we'll see Sauron do that. But at some point, Melkor gathers to him all his evil spirits, and he builds what must be the first army of darkness. Now, I feel like I've already said this a lot, but there are no orcs at this time, so Melkor's army is going to be made up entirely of evil Maya, evil spirits, and presumably most of them would be Balrogs. But Melkor still fears Tulkas the Champion, and so despite his strength, he waits and bides his time while the Ainur of Almaren enjoy their peace. Now, after, I don't know, a hundred years, a thousand years, it doesn't really matter, time doesn't really exist at this point, Manwe held a great feast, and all of the Ainur gathered. And there was a time of celebration because, as well as a feast, there was also a wedding amongst the Valar. So I said in the last episode that Tulikas and his spouse Nessa weren't technically married yet, and that was true because it's here on Alamaren that the two of them finally tie the knot. And I don't want to dwell too long on this, but surely this has got to be the greatest party in like ever in the universe, right? I mean, gods are getting married. I don't know how you could find a better wedding than that. But I guess, well, just like the best parties, it does seem to be pretty tiring because the groom Tulkas actually passes out and falls asleep. Now this is the moment that Melkor has been waiting for. So, he came in secret to the very north of Arida and he hid behind the Lamp Iluin so that none of the Ainur of Almaren were able to see him. And it's here, in the very north of the world, that Melkor begins delving his first evil stronghold, the dark citadel of Utumno, also known as Udun. Flame of Udun! And guys, this place is awful, like truly terrible, like it really is a gateway to hell. Tolkien uses such amazingly vivid language to describe the evil of this place that I want to read you just a few of his words so you get a true idea of exactly what kind of evil and ugliness I'm talking about. So Tolkien says this, Melkor began the delving of a vast fortress deep under earth beneath dark mountains where the beams of Iluin were cold and dim, and the spring of Arida was marred. Green things fell sick and rotted, and rivers were choked with weeds and slime, and fens were made rank and poisonous, the breeding place of flies. And forests grew dark and perilous, and beasts became monsters of horn and ivory, and dyed the earth with blood. So it looks like our period of peace and paradise is well and truly over. 
But obviously, when these rivers and forests and green places become corrupted, the Valar soon realise that Melkor has returned, and they know they have to do something about it. But unfortunately, they're all too late. Because what they don't know is that Melkor has already begun a surprise attack. But his target is not Almaren. No, it is the lamps. Now guys, this is huge. Because Melkor and his servants come forth suddenly to war. And they assail the great pillars that hold up the lamps. And as the pillars break, the lamps fall. And the lands beneath them are seared by flame. Now, if we take a look at a map of Middle-earth, we'll see that in the south, where Urumal once stood, there is forever after a vast and desolate area that is covered entirely in ash. And this black land will one day go on to be known as Mordor. In fact, Mordor simply means the black land. And so it was originally created by the ruinous fire of Urumal. And similarly, in the north, where the Pillar Helkar falls, it splits the land and breaks the continents, and new seas are formed. So the destruction of the lamps truly is an apocalyptic event. You know, five minutes ago, I was saying how beautiful everything is, but now there is only rubble and ruin, and the years of the lamps are brought to an utter end. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, the Valar do not take this lying down, especially Tulkas, who has definitely woken up between now and then, and he is furious. In fact, Melkor flees back to Utumno when he hears the earth shaking beneath the feet of Tulkas, and he hears the roaring voice of his brother Manwe on the mighty wind. But unfortunately, the Valar aren't able to chase down Melkor because, to be honest, they've got more important things to do. Arda is literally falling apart, and it takes the power of all the Valar to prevent it from being utterly destroyed. You know, Aule and Ulmo are busy restraining the tumults of the earth, and it's up to Varda and Yavanna to save as much of the land as they can. Now, although we know that the Valar are successful in preventing the total annihilation of Arda, their domain of Alamaren is completely gone, and there's not enough left of the Spring of Arda to ever rebuild it. So the Valar and all their faithful Maya are left homeless, and so they venture west, and in fact they go about as far west as west goes. Now, as you can probably guess, without the lamps, Arida is plunged into total darkness. And all that's left of the light of the Ainur shines in Varida's stars. Now, it's just a little side note, but this vast, empty continent that now lies in total darkness is what will one day be Middle-earth. And it's at this time, after the destruction of the lamps, that the continent becomes more like what we're familiar with, although it's still not exactly the same as it will be in the Third Age. For example, at this point, it is still completely dark and completely under the dominion of Melkor. So, in the uttermost west, the Valar and their Maya do eventually find a new continent across the sea that is called Aman. And it's here that the Valar build their second paradise, their second heaven in Arida. And they call this place Valinor. But the Valar have learned a lesson from the ruins of Almaren, and they vow that such a cataclysm will never happen to them again. So they raise up a great ring of the tallest mountains in Arida, and these mountains are called the Pelori, and they effectively act as a barrier guarding Valinor from anything and everything on the other side. Now the tallest mountain in this range is called Taniquetil, and Taniquetil is the tallest mountain on Arida, and it's here that Manwe and Varda set up their thrones and face the dark lands in the east to ensure that they will never again be taken unawares by the enemy. 
and this western land of Valinor will be their home for the rest of the story. And Valinor is actually the place that the elves sailed to at the end of the Third Age. It's known by them more commonly as the Undying Lands, but you know that scene right at the end of Return of the King when Frodo and Gandalf and everyone else set sail into the west? They are sailing to Valinor to go live with the gods. How nice is that? But in Valinor, the Valar build themselves a great city that they call Valmar, the city of many bells. And right outside the city's western gate is a great green mound called Ezelohar. Now, it's on this mound that Yavanna sings into life what are, without a doubt, the two most important trees in the entire legendarium. One of these trees bears golden fruit, and he is called Laureline. And the other bears silver flowers, and she is called Teleperion. Now, as I say, these trees are going to be incredibly significant. And in a very roundabout way, the silver one, Teleperion, is actually the distant ancestor of what will one day become the White Tree of Gondor, that we see in the courtyard of Minas Tirith in Return of the King. But anyway, these trees, believe it or not, were watered with the tears of Nienna. You remember, she is the goddess of weeping and pity and compassion. And the dew from both these trees is collected by Varda into great wells. You see, as I'm sure you can guess, these aren't ordinary trees. And no, not just because they're sung into existence and watered with tears, which is pretty unusual, but these trees also give off the only light in Arida. And so, while the eastern lands of Middle-earth remain in total darkness, within the walls of the Pelori Mountains within Valinor, the Valar do light. And this light is not too dissimilar from the light of the lamps. It's that same divine Ainua light. And so anyone who looks upon these trees will be bathed in their enlightening magic. Now that's going to be important later. But just before I finish this video, there's one more thing I want to say, because although most of the Valar seldom leave their guarded realm of Valinor, they haven't entirely forsaken the lands of Middle-earth. And there are three Valar in particular who do venture east from time to time. First is Ulmo, who, remember, dwells in the rivers and the lakes of Middle-earth, and there he keeps the evil at bay. And you see, that's the reason that although Melkor dominates the land, he never, ever develops any sort of mastery over the water. Now, the second Valar who ventures east is Orome, the Huntsman, and he takes pride in riding through the darkness and slaying the many monsters of Melkor, and he's going to be very important in our next episode. But finally, there is Yavanna, for she is the mother of trees and nature, and she too cannot abandon her creations and her beloved forests to the Dark Lord. But perhaps the greatest act of defiance against evil comes from Varda herself. Because if you remember in the beginning of the last episode, I talked about how Eru Iluvatar showed the Ainur a vision of what was to come. Now, this doesn't mean the Valar are psychic, and we know they're not omniscient, they don't know everything, but they do have an idea of Eru Iluvatar's master plan. And those who are most akin with Eru, i.e. Manwe and Varda especially, they know that it was never Eru's intention for Arda to be inhabited solely by Ainur. And somewhere far to the east, Eru has laid to rest his firstborn children. Now, it's because of this knowledge that Varda stands atop the peak of Taniquatil and faces Middle-earth. And it's here that she begins the greatest of all her labours. You see, Varda fills the blackness of night with light. And she kindles the greatest of all the stars, the mighty constellations. And the absolute mightiest of all these constellations are the seven stars of the Valakirka, the sickle of the gods which is actually Tolkien's version of the constellation that we call the Plow, or the Big Dipper. Now, Varda hangs these stars in the uttermost north, 
above Utumno as a threat upon the Dark Lord, a symbol of hope and a token of Melkor's eventual doom. And I and I love this. I always like to imagine Melkor stepping out of Utumno and looking up at these stars and being constantly reminded of Varda. Because remember, in the time before the music, Melkor was in love with Varda, but she absolutely hated him. And I feel like these stars are a massive screw you to the Dark Lord. Like, yeah, Melkor now lives in darkness exactly how he wanted, but the flip side of Eternal Night is that the stars will never stop shining. And I believe that Varda knows, in the end, she is faithful to Eru Iluvatar, and Melkor is not. So, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter how much Melkor destroys, or what he corrupts, or how many people he kills, because at the end of all things, Eru Iluvatar will prevail. And we know this too, because at the end of The Lord of the Rings, Frodo, Sam, and Gollum all do what they need to do to ensure that the One Ring is finally destroyed. And with it, all the evil that Melkor made, and later inspired in the case of Sauron, is also destroyed. And Melkor's evil stain upon Arda starts to fade as the Fourth Age begins. But the stars, the stars will shine forever. Anyway, I just think that's really beautiful and, and really cool. But these stars do actually serve another purpose, although neither Varda nor any of the Valar know it yet. For you see, in a far off place in the utter east, that neither the Valar, nor the Maya, nor even Melkor have ever seen, lie the waters of awakening. And it's here that Eru Iluvatar laid to rest the first ever elves. And it is in this exact moment, when Varda stars shine through the darkness for the very first time, that the very first elf opens his eyes and looks up. And dear friends, that I'm afraid is where I'm going to have to finish this episode. But next week, we're going to have a great time looking at the origins and awakenings of the race of elves. So to make sure you don't miss it, make sure you hit that subscribe button and the little notification bell. And because you beautiful people have all made it to the end of another episode, I have another fun Tolkien fact for you all. Now this fact is actually quite relevant to what I've just been talking about, the stars. But maybe not in the way you might expect. You see, in real life, in 1997, 24 years after Tolkien died, NASA and the European Space Agency sent a probe into space to fly around the planet Saturn and take a bunch of pictures. I mean, there's probably more to it than that, but what you need to know is that a part of this mission involved landing on the surface of Saturn's largest moon, Titan. And there it discovered a load of unknown mountains and hills and all sorts of things that astronomers get really excited about. Now, what does this have to do with Tolkien? Well, when these pictures returned to Earth, some NASA scientists had the very important job of giving these mountains and hills names. And whichever awesomely nerdy scientist it was looked to Tolkien for inspiration. And so this is true. On the surface of Titan, a moon not much smaller than the planet Mars, which orbits Saturn 1.2 million kilometers from Earth, there are mountains called Taniquetil, and Erebor, and Angmar, and Moria. And my absolute personal favorite, there's a volcano in the largest mountain range on Titan that is actually named for Mount Doom. And that's not all, there are actually some small hills on Titan that are technically called coals, which is just the Latin for hill, everything in space has to be in Latin for some reason. And some of these hills are named Gandalf, Faramir, Arwen, and ironically, the biggest is called Bilbo. Now it's pretty amazing to think. Tolkien died in 1973, but his names, his legends, his languages, can now be found out there 
amongst the stars. I can think of no better way to honor Tolkien's creative genius than to send his languages out into the solar system and beyond the reaches of our planet Earth. Anyway, thank you all very much for watching, and until next time, dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Navaya Melanine.